Hello, welcome to Curator's Corner, Crossfire Hurricane with Josh Campbell. I'm Shauna Oltmans. I'm the Exhibitions and Programs Manager here at the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us today. Spy Museum historian and curator, Andrew Hammond, will be talking with Josh Campbell about his new book, Crossfire Hurricane, Inside Donald Trump's War on the FBI. Josh spent over 10 years in the FBI as a supervisory special agent and served as special assistant to FBI director James Comey. His book provides a fly on the wall account from the earliest days of the Russia investigation. He is now a CNN correspondent covering national security and law enforcement and is a reservist in the Navy. After Andrew and Josh's conversation, we'll turn to your questions. So you don't want to hear from me anymore. Uh, Andrew, over to you and Josh. Thank you, Shana. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you today, Josh. And for anyone out there that's celebrating St. Patrick's Day, um, I'm sorry we couldn't bring you someone that was Irish and someone else with a, an Irish last name, but you've got the next best thing you've got. Josh has got a very Scottish last name and of course myself. So um, yeah, happy St. Patrick's Day if you're celebrating that. So the, 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 the first question that I was thinking of start or the first, the way that I was thinking of starting off Josh was January the 6th, 2017, which just so happens to be four years before the, um, what has been called the insurrection. So tell us where you were that day, set the scene for us, because that's quite an important day in your story and in your book. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for having me and to all those who are uh, logged in right now watching. Uh, this is interesting doing this, uh, uh, these kind of talks virtually. I always prefer in person, but obviously it's the, the sign of the times. But uh, thank you so much for spending the time here. Um, to go back and I think to really set the scene for not only uh, you know, what I talk about in the book, but also what we continue to deal with as a country, uh, I think a lot of the, the relationship between the now former Trump administration and the intelligence community uh, and the FBI and the Justice Department, a lot of that friction can be traced back to, as you mentioned, January 6, 2017. And that was the day, if you'll recall, where uh, James Comey and the other heads of the U.S. intelligence community met with then uh, President-elect Donald Trump at Trump Tower uh, to brief him uh, on a couple of things. First, the Russian, uh, what, what the intelligence community had assessed as related to Russian interference in the 2016 election. But then all, obviously Comey had that other responsibility of sensitizing Trump to this so-called Steele dossier that was out there with this alleged information about uh, tawdry details about Trump's past. Uh, and I say that that set the stage for the relationship between, because a couple of things happened according to the participants. I was there uh, on that day, I traveled up as, uh, as Comey's assistant. Um, and it, it's, it was interesting to hear some of the readouts and what some of the principals from the intelligence community said about that meeting because the focus from the Trump team, according to them, was after they were briefed on the Russian efforts to interfere in the election, the focus was not so much on uh, how do we stop this threat, this is a grave threat to US national security. The focus appeared to be from the Trump team more centered on, well, will this make us look like we are illegitimate? And how do we you know, focus on that aspect? So that alarmed some of the participants, but also according to Comey, who I talked to afterwards and you know, obviously great length um, uh, following that, that, uh, that meeting, it's interesting to see how the two sides saw that meeting. You had James Comey and the intelligence community officials wanting to sensitize an incoming president to this information, which was unverified at the time, but had been you know, circling in, in media and, and government circles. Uh, and they wanted the Trump team to know so that the president wasn't blindsided. Donald Trump, according to some of the readouts from his team and, and you know, what he said afterwards, thought that that was the intelligence community trying to potentially blackmail him to set up some kind of relationship, kind of this J. Edgar Hoover style, you know, hey, we want you to know we have some of this bad information, uh, you know, just keep that in mind. And so the, the motivation couldn't have been more different. Obviously, I mentioned the intelligence community wanted him to know what was out there. And I say that set the stage because 
obviously Donald Trump's presidency was um, marked by this ongoing collision between you know politics and the intelligence community and law enforcement. And I think because we know that Donald Trump you know sees people, if you're not part of the team, then you're a potential enemy. I think that was his view of much of the intelligence community from the start. That look, there's something am amiss here. Uh, I'm skeptical. Perhaps you know these people are my enemy, and I'm going to treat them as such. And what prompted you to write the book? Tell us a little bit more about how that came to be and uh, what, what was the motivation behind it? Yeah, so I, just to kind of give the, the quick summary, I mean, my background, I was, I was in the FBI, I was a career agent, and even my time in the director's office, uh, you know, I wasn't a political appointee, I was a, a senior career FBI agent uh, who had the pleasure of serving, you know, there in the director's office and in many different other assignments uh, around the world. And for me, if you remember, you know, kind of back to that place in time in 2017, after James Comey is fired by Trump because he won't, you know, get rid of the Russia investigation, uh, the FBI FBI really started to absorb, you know, just constant attacks from, from the president and folks in his orbit. And for those of us who were, you know, rank and file agents, we were an analyst, we were looking left and right, wondering when someone was going to speak up and say that these lies that have been told about this agency are just that, this idea that there's some deep state, that they're out to get Donald Trump, that they were trying to stop him from becoming president, which is just nonsense. And I write a lot in the book about some of the actual uh, mistakes, some of them potentially criminal that some people inside the FBI actually did that was unearthed obviously later on. But this notion that this is an agency, a, a deep state cabal out to get Trump, we knew was nonsense, yet you had uh, the FBI director, you had the attorney general, you had people, uh, you know, high in government who weren't defending the FBI. And so, you know, imagine you're on on the receiving end of those kind of attacks, the CEO of wherever you work, this in this case, the president is calling you a crook day in and day out. That, that graded on me, that graded on my colleagues. And I felt that the American people uh, needed to know the truth about this agency, that it's flawed, it's imperfect, but it's not filled with a bunch of criminals who are trying to you know, take down a president. And so I just made that realization that I love this organization so much that I needed to step out of this organization um, and, and tell the story about the men and women of the FBI, uh, flaws and all, but to really set the record straight and then just very quickly, you know, I, I, I kind of look for a platform to do that. And uh, obviously uh, went to CNN. Uh, and when I started, I was getting calls from people saying, well, you know, we, we understand that you, you probably want to write a book. You know, we'd love to work with you, some of the book agents. And to me, I, I, like, I never wanted to write a book and I never thought about that. And I certainly didn't want to write a memoir. Uh, and so I just kind of, you know, put them off, put them off until one uh, group of, of agents that I actually ended up talking to said, no, we want to tell the story that you think the American people need to know. And that is, what was it like in 2016 uh, to, to go through this, to have a president coming after your organization and to really set the record straight. And so that, that is what led to the book um, to really be able to kind of dive in and take, take our viewers into the room to really understand what it would like to be in this organization at that time. And one of the things that I think would be really interesting for people that are not familiar with the FBI, walk us through the, the decision-making process as someone that is unhappy and wants to do something about it. So almost like a flow chart, what are the, what are the options? So there's stay inside and try to change it from inside. There's, you know, speak to someone at the New York Times, there's leave and try to do it outside the tent rather than in. Walk us through those various options. And one of the things that um, I enjoyed when, when we spoke earlier, Josh, was, you know, you, you come across as, you know, uh, fresh, ebullient, optimistic. You don't look like a lot of the, the people that, you know, we tend to associate with the disgruntled former you know, federal employee who's beaten down, you know, you've, you've got kind of like uh, a lot of life and verve about you. So was that part of the reason why you left? Because you just thought if I stay here, it's just going to make me very unhappy or just walk us through those various options and why you chose the one that you chose. No, I appreciate that. Um, so I think the, the most important thing to understand kind of my, my rationale and, you know, the book, I, I really am not about uh, telling a memoir, like, you know, this is my story. This is what I was feeling. I mean, there's some of that, but I, I don't 
think that readers find that very interesting. I mean, it's certainly my, my ego is not such that I need to write a book to tell you how I was feeling. It was mainly focused on telling you what was happening. Um, and so that was the focus, but the decision to, to leave and then to, you know, kind of do what I'm doing now to help tell the, the truth about these, uh, the, these agencies really centered on me looking into the future. And I had a couple options. You know, I, I love the FBI. I still love the FBI. I talk to people inside the FBI almost every day. Um, but I came to that realization that I didn't want to look back 15 years, you know, uh, from now on or from then on retirement, knowing that I could have spoken out and, and, and helped the American people understand what was real and what was not. But then to know that I just kept my head down just to draw a paycheck, right, or a pension. And so that was not an easy, easy decision. I mean, it was a damn t awful decision to try to make. Um, but I came to that realization that you know, what the team, the team Trump folks were saying at that time is that, that this is some deep state, they're anti-Trumpers. And so, you know, I actually had that thought that, you know, uh, you know, if you stay in an organization, and as you say, just kind of leak anonymously right to the press to, to bash the president or whatever, I mean, that actually justifies this accusation of, a, of some kind of deep state, uh, which, I, which I, you know, don't think exists, and I certainly wasn't going to be a part of. And so I did what I think and, you know, thought was the right thing, and that was stepping out of the agency to say in my own name what I believed, um, not anonymously or, or um, you know, to, to to do so in that fashion, but to actually just say, look, no, this is what I saw, this is what I think, and this is what the public uh, should believe. Um, and and uh, what I hope folks take away is that, you know, it's it's not just, I mean, when people talk about brand management, like right in the, in the private sector, oh, a company wants to know, wants the public to trust them and to appreciate them. I mean, that goes back to the bottom line, uh, a company's bottom line, but for the FBI and for the intelligence community, they're, they, they need public trust in order to do their job. And as I described in the book, some of the examples of being an FBI agent in the field, you know, when I knocked on someone's door conducting an investigation and needed their help, their decision to, to help me and the FBI solve a crime or you know, try to stop some threat was directly correlated to their view on the FBI, about the FBI. When I said those three letters, FBI, what hopefully came to their mind was this is a person and an organization that is known to be trustworthy, and this is someone that I'm going to I'm going to be willing to help. The problem with the, the Trump assault on the FBI is that there were real world consequences to, to trust in the FBI. Polling opinion showed that FBI public confidence in the FBI started to tank, and so. It's not just, well, you know, we thought that Trump was being mean or that we want to maintain a good reputation. This was a matter of public safety, that if the public actually believed this nonsense about this organization, that that would then endanger uh, the public and prevent us from being able to do their job. And that is why I'm so passionate about talking about this. Again, you know, as a journalist, I, I report on the flaws about the FBI and other intelligence agencies all the time. If you're out there and you know a flaw, you know, you should be out there sounding the alarm. Um, but I think in the main, that's what the public needs to know, that this is an organization of, of people that go to work every single day trying to stop threats, trying to prevent, uh, you know, attacks, trying to help people and bring justice. And that is the FBI that, that the American people should know about. There's a great example at the beginning of the book where you talk about the power of those three letters, FBI, where you're in Los Angeles and you're in plain clothes and you assist an officer uh, with two, uh, you know, two suspects, and you you just mentioned that you're in the FBI, and the the, <laughs> the suspect just starts confessing that he's got drugs, and you know, yeah. uh, so forth. Um, it's quite a nice vignette. No, exactly, and just and I, I write about it. Folks can can read about it, but essentially, you know, I was driving home. And I see a police officer that has someone stop and he's trying to hold down uh, a couple of suspects. And so, you know, as a law enforcement officer, you're always looking out for each other. And, you know, there's one officer and two suspects. Obviously, I was going to try to assist. And so I whip around and, and roll up, uh, you know, grab one of the guys and, and just kind of as a force multiplier. And it turns out that they had robbed this store and, and the cop's partner had run off to try to catch another suspect. And it was interesting because, you know, you, you, you try to be uh, thick skin. I mean, the suspects are hurling all kinds of, uh, you know, names and invectives and, and me and the LAPD guy, the Los Angeles police guy are just kind of waiting for backup. And once it arrived and one of the cops asked me, well, who are you with? And I said, I'm with the FBI. One of the suspects turns around 
and is like his, I still remember seeing his face, his eyes like light up, like the FBI. And he just starts confessing to all this uh, contraband that's in his backpack and some of the things that he's done. And so to your point, I mean, that shows the power of that brand that people, you know, respect it enough that even suspects are like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is important what's happening here. Um, and so, you know, this is just one of many types of stories like that I tell in the book of just how important it is to have a strong brand because there's a direct correlation to, to public safety. And tell us a little bit more about the character and culture of the FBI. So, you know, for people that haven't been part of it, it's difficult to, you know, get your head around, but reading your book, uh, listening to you speak, or recently we had Frank Figluzzi on, and, and it's so palpable, the, the almost reverence that a lot of uh, former FBI uh, agents have for the institution. Like, help us understand that. Is this, is this misplaced reverence? Uh, wh wh where does it come from? Um, you know, you, you, you speak elsewhere about how a lot of people join an organization and discuss what they've taken, you know, what they've given to the organization. But with the FBI, it's the opposite. You think about what the FBI has, get, the FBI has given you. So just help us understand that a little bit more of the character of the institution. You know, it is an organization whose mission is to do justice, right, to bring justice to victims of crime, to bring justice to suspects and to ensure that those who are out there trying to harm people no longer do that. And, you know, there's a there's a risk when you talk about the FBI or someone who's in the FBI, maybe sounding too sanctimonious, like, you know, this is an organization of patriots. But I don't care about that because because it is because I saw it. And I don't know, you know, where exactly that comes from, except to say that, you know, when you join an organization, and I can still remember being a young, brand new FBI agent, you know, in training, from day one, you're constantly reminded that your job is different, that you, you know, if you want to go make money, you do that elsewhere. If you want prestige, you know, you go do that elsewhere. If you want to help people, you do that here. And that's kind of your focus. And the thing I've, I've learned as well, you know, now having left the FBI and, and not being, you know, surrounded uh, by FBI agents and analysts every single day is that the organization is unique because you're constantly, you know, as iron sharpens iron, so to speak, you're reminding each other uh, what your mission is every single day and just to be surrounded by people who, who you know, come into work kind of with that mindset that I'm here um, to, to bring, to do justice uh, it is a powerful thing. And that's why you hear people like me, you know, former FBI. I can tell you also, I, I worked extensively with the CIA and the NSA throughout my career. My career was a, a bit different in that so much of my work was overseas, uh, some of my investigations. So I was embedded with, you know, folks from CIA and NSA and the military. Uh, and so this isn't exclusive to the FBI, this, this culture of, of service and patriotism. Uh, it's certainly in, in there as, you know, in CIA and NSA and, and other agencies as well. Uh, but but speaking from the FBI, I think that that's what it comes down to. And again, I don't, I don't want to sound sanctimonious, but that is what people think every single day that I, I know what my mission is. And you're constantly reminded of that. And that is why just I think this is also important to note that when people embarrass the FBI or that people, you know, do something that's wrong, that they violate their oath, which does occur. And as we saw, and I write about in the book, uh, th there were instances of that inside the FBI, not to the extent that, that Trump has tried to portray, um, but there's no one more disappointed uh, and, and angry, in fact, to see and hear things like that than people who, who are actually wearing the badge or that, that you know, have taken that oath, uh, because they know that you have now made it more difficult for them to do their job in an honorable way if people actually start to doubt that this agency is credible. Um, and so I, I hope people understand that as well, that, you know, it's, it's an imperfect institution, you know, right now inside the FBI, someone is doing something that they shouldn't be doing. I mean, it's just the nature of any organization that's 30,000 plus people. Um, but in the main, again, this is an organization of people who do it for the right reasons. Uh, and thankfully, in our society, we have processes and, and uh, you know, mechanisms of oversight that are in place to, to keep check and watch over people in the FBI and other agencies who, who wield, you know, incredible power. And one of the other, so I want to pivot back onto the book and onto your thesis. So let's just deal with the elephant in the room. You know, the, the title of the book, uh, Donald Trump's War on the FBI, you know, is that, is that hyperbolic or, you know, was it really a war against the FBI or, you know, 
help us understand like where the thesis of the book comes from and 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 why you think it's the correct thesis yeah so obviously obviously not a physical war but but a war a political war with very serious consequences and i think the best way to understand it is to compare what past presidents uh, and past elected leaders have, have done and how they've operated, compare that with Donald Trump, and then it becomes very clear how uh, uh, you know dangerous what he was doing was as it relates to public safety. I went back in the book and looked at, you know, for every president from the Nixon Watergate era, you know, to the president, and uh, every one of them, with the exception of uh, Barack Obama, had someone senior in their uh, administration that was investigated by the Justice Department and the FBI. Um, but in each of those instances, you didn't see this campaign of attack that Donald Trump engaged in, just this full-on assault, uh, calling FBI agents criminals, his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and others calling them uh, Nazis, I mean, comparing them to, to murderous uh, Nazis, which, you know, which occurred, and then doubling down when, when challenged. And so just this all-out campaign to try to undermine the credibility of this institution. And the reason is, in, in my view, my assessment and the assessment of others, is because at the time when the Mueller investigation was underway, uh, you know, Trump saw that as a threat. And so he just, you know, he decided, uh, and those in his orbit, that in order to undermine the credibility of what eventually comes out of this investigation, I need to undermine the credibility of those doing the investigating. And that led to this, you know, this call, the, the spygate, the deep state, just calling these people crooks on and on and on. And you had segments of society, you know, Trump's base that started to believe those lies that, you know, these, oh, this, which is, which is interesting because and we can talk about the deep state thing if you want a little you know a little more in depth but you know as you as you as you lay out the arguments for this deep state I mean it's a house of cards it, it falls you know quickly when you start to, to realize it but Trump I think because he's you know a, a, an effective brand manager um, was able to to kind of launch launch that campaign against these agencies and the problem is is that that's fine in politics like you know if you're campaigning if a politician is campaigning against another politician the goal is to make yourself look good and maybe at times try to undermine what the public thinks about your opponent and after an election few people sit around and, and you know wonder what happened to the person that lost it's, okay you regroup you try to go back and, and have another go the problem is that we're not talking about politicians we're talking about a politician the president going after a national security Security institution. And if the public actually believes that this organization is corrupt, then that has all the effects, the negative effects that I just talked about a little while ago. And so it, it, it was a war in the sense, a political war to undermine the credibility of this institution. Unfortunately, a lot of people believed it. And that is where this organization and others find themselves now is trying to kind of repair that damage to try to uh, uh, reinstitute some you know, level of confidence to the extent that it was in the past. Uh, in the wake of, of you know, the, the presidency of Donald Trump. And I've seen you comment elsewhere that the FBI as an institution tends to lean conservative. So I think it's quite interesting to hear your views on the effect of the Trump presidency on the institution and on the politics. Um, you know, did, did you see the same fissures amongst you know, conservative leaning FBI agents who uh, that, that, that we see in contemporary politics where some people are, you know, pro-Trump, some are anti or was everybody anti-Trump in the FBI. Help us understand a bit of that culture. Obviously, we're talking about tens of thousands of people and, you know, we're, we're, we're generalizing here, but help us understand the, the impact on that conservatism within the FBI. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's it's um, it's accurate to say that the the politics of the FBI, uh, and you're right, you know, you don't want to over-index, but just you know, based on my experience, is that it, it leans more conservative, and I think that's because it's kind of this paramilitary uh, type outfit. And I know, you know, I'm, I'm still in the military now as a reservist, and it's it's those kind of institutions that just happen to lean, you know, politically conservative. That's not to to broad brush everyone, but what is so fascinating about that is that you know, again, if you dissect what Trump did and, and what he said about the FBI and these organizations, I mean, first of all, you look at people like Comey and Mueller and Andrew McCabe. I mean, these are all Republicans that he was trying to convince the public had somehow, you know, decided to go after him, which, you know, none of it makes any sense if you actually start to dissect, like, well, what he's actually saying. But also inside the organization, you know, I, I hear people often say that, you know, the FBI, you check your politics at the door. Um, 
which is kind of half right. I mean, you know, you know, just like, you know, in any organization or setting, I mean, sometimes people feel comfortable talking about politics amongst each other. I mean, you know that it, there's no way that it's going to impact your work. Uh, that's just the ethos. And obviously, you know, you have people looking over each other's shoulders, I mean, to make sure, but they're not, you know, FBI agents and analysts are not robots. I mean, they have beliefs. And, you know, you, if you have a, an institution filled with people who are curious about the world, they're obviously going to form personal opinions about the world. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't want them doing these kind of jobs, you know, in these positions where you have to be curious. Um, so, but that's a long winded way of saying that, you know, it, it's, mo it's mostly conservative people. And so to think that this, this, you know, institution all of a sudden would flip and go after a president. Uh, who's a Republican just makes no sense. And it's also worth noting that I know based on my experience that some of the most uh, angry people who, you know, some of the most vociferous, uh, you know, responses to Donald Trump's attacks came from my friends that I knew were conservative and, and far right. And so that just showed that it was kind of, it, there was no political dynamic there at play. People who, you know, whether they're Republican or Democrat, if they were being called crooks by the president, they were going to speak out and say something. And then just the, the last you know, point I want to make on that is if you go back to 2016, and, and this just, for, for me, and I hope for the viewers as well, that this you know, gives you some idea of just how you know, nonsensical some of this deep state thing, stuff was. So, so Trump would have the public believe that this right of center institution was trying to go after him and prevent him from becoming president, yet... American voters went to the election, went to the polls in November 2016, not knowing that the Trump team was under FBI investigation. And that's important because, and, and Comey got a lot of criticism for you know, treating the Clinton case differently than, than treating the, the Trump team case. And I write about those criticisms in the book. Um, but if the FBI was really out to get Donald Trump and was really this cabal of deep state, you know, uh, crazy leftists, someone would have leaked that his four people in his, in his campaign were under FBI investigation. And I think you know, that could have been lights out on his campaign. Uh, but of course, they didn't do that. They, they did their investigation secretly, which they've been criticized for, for treating that differently than the Clinton case. But it goes to show that you know, it's just a house of cards. As you peel back you know, each part of, of some of these arguments, you, you see just how nonsensical some of this stuff was. Uh, so that, that's kind of my, my view on kind of the, the political side of the organization and you know, how that relates to some of the criticism. And how would you deal with the, you know, people that maybe don't read the book or engage with your argument, but people that just see the cover, you know, maybe see that you're on CNN and just think, oh, he's, you know, he's, he, he's telling us it's a conservative institution, but he's a, he's a closet liberal who just wants to have a cheap shot and make some money um, from this position that he found himself in. So I was just wondering, you know, what, what some of them may well watch this on YouTube. What, what, how would you directly address them? Yeah. So, well, the money thing is is easy because uh, half the proceeds of this book went is going actually to a fund that that cares for the family of fallen FBI agents, and that was important to me because for that reason I didn't want to seem as uh, oh you're like cashing in on your FBI experience. Uh, so to be able to use that for good was was important to me. Uh, but also, you know, I tell people, and I knew this you know, stepping out of law enforcement and, and into the media, that there might be this baked in, uh, you know, constituency of critics who say, well, uh, you know, you, you know, it's, it's fascinating because, and we could talk, you know, probably hours and hours about my view about the media and Donald Trump. Uh, but I think the, the best, the, the person who summed it up best for me was actually Carl Bernstein, who's, you know, one of my colleagues at CNN. And what he said is that, you know, it is jarring to the ear to report every day that the president is a serial liar. Uh, that just, you know, you, you know, no one wants to say that because that's just that that's, you know, that's obviously an uncomfortable thing. But what Bernstein said, which was fascinating about Trump, is that, you know, if if you as a journalist, if you're covering a president and he tells 10 lies in one day and you say, well, you know what, I'm not going to point out every single one of them because I don't want to seem like I'm piling on, then some of those lies are going to slip through and people are actually going to believe, you know, what he's saying. But if at the end of the week, Donald Trump says, you know, look at the media. They attacked me 70 times this week and said I was a liar. Obviously, they're piling on. That is somewhat persuasive to some of, you know, his base. And so, but Bernstein's point was you have to keep pointing out the lies because our job is to help the public understand the truth. And so I, I, I mentioned that to say because I knew coming in, 
to an organization that's dedicated to that. I mean, my, my colleagues at CNN uh, are, are some of the most impressive people that, again, you know, have a very similar mission, I think, to the FBI to uncover the truth and to ensure that the public understands what's going on, that institutions are held accountable. Um, but I just ask people to just judge me by my work. Um, and, and, you know, for example, the, the day I started here, uh, you had the president's son and there was this uh, former um, uh, I won't even mention the name, but a former like Trump person who came out like bla uh, blasting, you know, oh, this guy, you know, and, and I just knew then that ignore the critics, just, you know, d focus on the work and the public will understand, I hope, in looking at the totality of, you know, what, I, what I've said, what I've done, uh, that my focus here is just is simply to uh, have the public understand what's right, what's wrong, what's the truth. Uh, and, and I hope that's how they judge, uh, you know, me and my work. And I think if if you read the book, I mean, I think I'm, I'm fair enough where, you know, I, I criticize, uh, uh, you know, it's not just a rah, rah, the FBI is amazing, the FBI is great, there's a lot of criticism in there as well. I think it's important, you know, to maintain my own credibility is to just speak, you know, as I see it. And I want to turn to former director Comey, but before we get there, I was just wondering, how does one become the assistant to the director of the FBI? Is that is it happenstance? Is it knowing the right person? Is it, you know, just the luck of the draw? Is it an application process? Help our viewers understand how you find yourself in that position. You know, it's interesting. So I, uh, I was an FBI agent in the field and I worked a lot overseas. And then as you go into uh, management, if you decide to go into management, some, some people don't, they, you know, they work cases their whole career and they are seen, uh, excuse me, just as, uh, uh, on, the, on the same level or even maybe higher in the eyes of people. Uh, so it's not an organization where you have to promote in order to, you know, to make yourself, you know, look uh, in some way. Um, but some people, leadership is important and they want to go into a position of leadership. And that was my focus as well. I mean, this is an organization that, that I love, that I want to see do better. There are things that I would change. And so as I went up in my career, I, you know, was promoted to a supervisory agent. And as it related to Comey, I mean, I actually... So the FBI director has uh, special assistants, uh, sometimes two, sometimes one. It's usually a very, very senior person uh, in, in the executive service. But what was fascinating with Comey, and this was just a um, uh, kind of a chance encounter that I had with him where I was, I was at FBI headquarters and I, I can still remember. So he was getting ready to, to do uh, uh, an event on opioid addiction, and you know, which is obviously a, it was a crisis then, it's a crisis now. And I just happened to find myself in the room with him, and his staff left, and so it was just the two of us, kind of waiting for this thing to start. And he just he you know asked me, hey, you know, who are you? What's what's your story? And just kind of started interviewing me, which he would always do with employees, just to get to know them. And it was fascinating because he he asked one of the questions, and this you know, Comey gets a lot of criticism. Some of it justified, uh, some of it not. But one thing that I know about him because I saw it myself is that he was always uh, uh, interested and concerned with ensuring that he wasn't just trapped in his own head on ideas. He would ask people, what are your thoughts? And in regard, he didn't care how junior you were. Uh, he wanted to know because he wanted to be effective. And so to that end, he actually asked me, um, and this is just the two of us, like, you know, in this room, me, junior, him, obviously the, the head of the organization, he said, you know, how am I doing? And what was interesting in that moment, this what actually crossed my mind. I thought, okay, I have, a, and at the time I have two weeks left at headquarters and then I'm going back to Los Angeles uh, where, I, where I live. Uh, I was gonna uh, go get promoted in another position there just uh, as you're, you move through assignments. And so I thought, okay, when am I gonna have an audience with the FBI director who's asking me what I think about how he is doing? And so I actually thought, well, okay, if I make him mad, what is he going to do? Like send me back to the field? I'm going there anyway in two weeks. Um, and because it's an organization that I love, there are things that I want to see fixed. And so I told him, I said, look, I think uh, that that you know you're, you're you're doing well, but. And then he interrupted and he said, but. And then I of course got mortified. And he said, no, I'm kidding. Like go, continue, continue. And so I just listed a, a few things that I thought were uh, you know were were not. Uh, happening fast enough. And, you know, I actually told him, I said, you know, this is a suspicious organization by its nature. And so if you, as a new FBI director, you come in and say, you're going to do things and, and you don't, you haven't done them yet. Uh, th that's not going to bode well. And so it was actually a pretty, you know, feisty debate back and forth. Um, and in the end, he said, you know, thank you so much for speaking, um, uh, you know, honestly and openly and, and for giving me feedback. And so I left 
like really, really satisfied that, you know, I got off my chest some of these issues that the FBI, everything from leadership to technology. Uh, and I felt satisfied that I was able to, to, you know, tell the, the director that. And so a week later, I find myself, I was back in Los Angeles, actually looking for a place to live and Comey calls and, and basically just in summary says, and I, of course I was mortified then too. Why is the FBI director calling me? Like, what, what did I do? Um, and, and basically the sum of what he said was, I know you're going back to LA, but instead of that, I want you to come work for me and help fix all those things that you said were screwed up. Um, and so that was my, uh, you know, my joining his staff. Um, and so I think two things there. First, I think it's important, you know, to note that that's kind of his caliber. Again, he wanted people in the room who weren't afraid to, um, to mix it up with them and to, you know, tell them when they thought he was wrong. But also it's, you know, and this is just kind of me personally, when people say, oh, well, you work for Comey, it, it's not a political thing. It is not a political appointee. In fact, in the FBI, one, you know, it, it is a uh, highly uh, sought after and, and well-regarded position to be on the director's staff. And so I, I felt uh, honored, honored to do that. Um, and, and that was kind of my, my story in joining his team. And one of the other things that I want to focus on before we hand it over to the questions from the viewers is thinking about um, thinking about the FBI, thinking about James Comey during that period. So you know, it's a really it's a really interesting and difficult period to be the FBI director. You know, the Clinton emails, Russian interference all of the other things that are going on. So, you know, as his assistant being with him day in, day out, help us just understand a little bit more about what is going on there. Because, I mean, I've read Comey's book and I've read what other people have written about him and everything that I can gather is that he's, he almost reminds me a little bit of Jimmy Carter and that he's so morally upright that some people actually find it a little irritating um, help us understand that the the character of the man and also what it was like to be there blow by blow through through this very turbulent period in, in modern American history yeah so you know he, he's, he's obviously a complicated figure people have different views on him and his decisions um, but I think the you know what, what I tell folks is that you know imagine you are the the director of the FBI and you now have both candidates for the presidency of the United States, or at least people in their orbit, under FBI investigation. Um, I mean, that, that is, I mean, think about those decisions that the, 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 the person who will, who will be the most powerful person in the world coming up next election um, could, that, that could be decided by every action that you take, you know, in the run up to that. And so, you know, what, what Comey said, and, you know, people can agree or disagree, but his view was that, look, it was a series of terrible options, you know, that he was dealt with. Uh, you know, one thing I talk about in the book is, um, and, and I think it's worth noting, I mean, I, I wasn't a decision maker, I was, you know, on a staff. And so I wasn't, you know, making decisions about the Hillary Clinton case and the Russia case. Um, uh, I don't want people walking away with that. Um, but, you know, one, one, one thing that I talk about, you know, in the book is, for example, you know, the, the press conference that he held to announce the, the Hillary Clinton uh, case would, would, he would not recommend prosecution, but then he obviously said, uh, uh, he went on to basically criticize her. Uh, and so that was a, you know, heavy criticism that he received, like, how would you go in front of the microphone and disparage someone who you're then saying that you're not going to investigate. So that, that's, you know, obviously criticism that he received. Um, and then the series of decisions that came after that from reopening the case. Um, and then, you know, the question about, well, how could you keep the Clinton case, uh, you know, how would you make that public yet keep the Trump Russia case secret? Uh, and it, what he has said since then is that it was, you know, the, the Russia case was so brand new, the FBI didn't know basically what it had at that time. Um, but I think the, you know, the key takeaway, people can disagree with him, his decisions. Uh, some people say that he impacted, you know, the, the reason we got Donald Trump was because of James Comey. Um, I, I don't know that that's knowable. I mean, it's certainly possible if you look at some of the, the polling data and how the election went right, right at the end. Um, but I think what I, what I hope people understand, and, and this isn't to, you know, excuse any decisions, people can, can make their own take, you know, have their own takeaway. Um, but I often hear Comey's, you know, his critics say that he's too sanctimonious, that he is too, he knows, you know, he's too confident in himself. Um, first of all, I say that ask yourself, you know, in an era where the president and so many in Congress and, and elsewhere 
just lied to the public on a day-to-day -day basis about things big and small, just a torrent of lies. The thing where they're criticizing Comey about is that he's too ethical. Like, okay, that, that's interesting. Um, but then secondly, I think that, you know, if you believe his what he says is that, look, it's it's a series of terrible options. I made the best decision, you know, that I could in each case. And obviously he, you know, he, he owned those decisions uh, and, and what resulted. Um, but, but the last thing I'll say is that I think that the, you know, the one thing I hear people say, well, you know, but for Comey, there would be no Donald Trump. Um, I would be careful with that argument because if you're criticizing Comey and saying that, that, you know, in their view, we got this awful administration because this guy made a decision that then cost Clinton the election. Uh, that may have been a follow on result, but you don't want an FBI director ever making a decision based on, well, who's going to get elected. Okay. The, you know, this candidate is terrible. He's a terrible person, which, you know, obviously Trump's critics have, have said. So do you want the FBI director saying, well, what can I do to stop him? That would actually feed this kind of deep state narrative. Um, so he's a complicated figure and, you know, he'll, he'll, um, uh, you know, he, he's obviously written about his experience, uh, you know, from, from his, his vantage point. But what I tried to do in the book is just let people know, you know, they can make their own decision about what he did. Uh, but I want you to know the person and the caliber. Uh, and I hope that comes through, you know, in the book. And one final question from me before we hand it over to the viewers, there's a, a book and a thesis, uh, out there that suggests that Donald Trump is in some way has in some way been compromised by Russian intelligence that that he's in some way influenced or or uh, shaped by Russian intelligence. I just wondered what your view was on that. A as a CNN analyst, but also B as a FBI uh, former FBI agent. Is there enough evidence there? to uh, take someone to court or is it circumstantial or w w walk us through your view of that situation? Yeah, so, you know, that is a question that has come up from, you know, the, the early stages of, you know, 2016 uh, election in the aftermath with the Steele dossier and the like, this question about, you know, is, do the Russians have some dirt on Donald Trump? And, that, and that's a spectrum because there's some people who say that Trump is a, a witting spy, right, or a, an asset for the Russian government. There are others who say that it's more nuanced, that maybe because um, of information that they may have on him, that maybe, uh, you know, th that is kind of motivating his action. So it's kind of the, the reverse. I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't think any of us do. But what I, what I do in my own mind, and this is, you know, as a former investigator looking at sets of facts and trying to draw conclusions from things that maybe aren't, aren't, aren't easy to determine, um, is one thing that still stands out for me is Donald Trump, you know, may be the president with the largest ego that we've ever had. And that's not a criticism because Trump will tell you he's great. I mean, he continues to say he, he's great. So when I say Trump has a giant ego, that's not, that's not a criticism of Donald Trump. But the thing you have to ask yourself is, why would someone with that gigantic ego capitulate to someone like Vladimir Putin, which Trump did time after time after time? It just doesn't square. I mean, remove the names, just use the attributes that you have this, this guy with all this bravado and ego, and I'm the best, I'm the greatest, I'm, my name is everywhere, you know, on buildings, yet I'm going to kowtow to this other leader almost every single time. There's a reason for that. We don't know what the we don't know what the reason is. I mean, some have suspected that it's probably more financial. That maybe the Russians had tried to you know back uh, Trump, bail him out uh, when he was facing you know financial turmoil, which would fly in the face of his you know saying, oh, I never did business with the Russians. Um, some say it's more sinister than that. Who, who knows? But I think we still have to keep asking the question because there is a reason why someone with that ego would do those actions which run counter to you know someone with those attributes uh and so it's it's a it's fair criticism i think uh you know buttressed by the fact that trump is con you know obviously constantly refused to release his tax returns um which could easily clear up the issue of you know financial entanglement um but yet he hasn't done and so i don't think all the criticism is fair i mean in absence of actual evidence but I think that he, he deserves some criticism because, you know, he could he could easily clear up some of this, which he obviously has not done. Well, I would love to continue to chat to you some other time, Josh, but I think we should hand it over to Shana. But it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise. Thank you.
Thank you both for that wonderful conversation. We have uh, a number of questions coming in covering all bases, so I'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, just to start us off though, uh, I wanted to ask, Josh, what do you say to people who say that uh, Crossfire Hurricane was really just a pretext to spy on Trump? Well, I mean, what I would say is that, first of all, Trump wasn't a suspect in the investigation, you know, initially when it started. I mean, if the investigation was, was started back in 2016, looking at four members of, of the Trump orbit. And the reason was, is because the FBI got information that uh, one of the, the Trump campaign uh, people uh, was bragging to a, a, a foreign ally about the Russians having dirt on Hillary Clinton. And so the question was, how would the Trump people know that the Russians have dirt on Clinton? And then this was in the wake of this, this uh, uh, you know, terrible campaign by the Russians to undermine American democracy by stealing information from the De Democratic Party, you know, Hillary Clinton's emails, all, all of that. Um, and people in, in Clinton world. And so the FBI was wondering, okay, so this attack is happening and you have Trump people over here saying that they know about dirt. We have to look into that. And so that was one person, but then there were three other people who had uh, what the FBI thought were questionable ties to the Russians. And so I mentioned that to say that, you know, if, if, if the FBI was really going after Donald Trump, they would have investigated, you know, Donald Trump, which they didn't do until much later after Trump ended up firing James Comey uh, over the Russia investigation. And so the timeline just, just doesn't square. And then, you know, the second thing I would say is that if you believe that the FBI, that they were a bunch of crooks, you know, and, and criminals and violated their oaths to go after Donald Trump, I mean, they did a terrible job at it. I mean, if that was the case, all these techniques at their, you know, at, at their fingertips, uh, surveillance tools and the like. I mean, if they were really uh, just disregarding their oath and wanted to be, you know, criminals to go after a president, uh, there were a lot of ways they could have done that in, in you know, a very skeevy way, but they, but they didn't. And then to circle back to the last point is that it goes back to just, you know, the timeline of what the public knew. No one, when they went to the, to the voting booth, knew that the Trump team was under investigation. So if this if this investigation was a vehicle to take down Donald Trump and to ensure, ensure that he would not become president, it didn't work. All right, and we've, we've got a question that came in from David Priest. He says, hello, uh, but he says, the Mueller report detailed some clear cases of, of obstruction of justice, but Congress dropped the ball and failed to, sh to follow up on them. What are the prospects for this new team at DOJ to look at the evidence and bring charges? Well, I think that will depend largely on whether the, the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel uh, agrees with some of the precedent in the past and, you know, what we saw during the Trump team. And that is, you know, the, the belief was that a, a, a sitting president couldn't, couldn't be prosecuted. There are very serious questions now, I mean, to, which gets to the heart of this question about whether now that Trump is no longer in office, uh, whether he could still be held accountable for some of those actions if he doesn't fall under that under the protection of that legal opinion that a current president can't be uh, investigated. And I think that there's a there's a possible chance of that. I mean, I think the the Biden team probably doesn't want some prolonged you know investigation into Donald Trump. They probably just are hoping that he would just go away. Um, but if you're a prosecutor and you're sitting on potential evidence of criminal activity, you know you, you have to look into that. The one thing that's fascinating, and I talked to a lot of investigators and, and obviously you know journalists who have covered this, is the Mueller team, uh, you know, through their investigation, they got a lot of criticism for for not going far enough. But they did capture witness testimony, witness statements. They gathered evidence, and that doesn't just go away after after an investigation and a report is finalized. That still exists. Uh, and so the question, you know, which uh, we don't know right now, but will that be used to actually look back on some of these uh, criminal charges? I think it's it's possible. Um, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. And then uh, can you name one thing that should change institutionally to avoid another uh, president, you know, causing damage to uh, an institution like this? Well, one thing that has been uh, floated, and this, I think this should be a topic of national conversation. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, have all the answers. I don't, I don't, uh, not a, a policy advocate, you know, in my role, uh, but the idea of uh, mandating the, you know, the term for the FBI director to, to actually legislate that an FBI director cannot be fired except for cause. Um, now, if you go back and I write this about this at length in the book is, you know, back in the J. Edgar Hoover days, um, you know, you had real instances that were unearthed by Congress of abuse. 
uh, the FBI overusing its authorities to target people and you know violating civil liberties. Um, and he was in office for almost 50 years. And so that led to this a 10 year term for the FBI director because they didn't want any more J. Edgar Hoover's, uh, you know, to stay in office that long. But the, the institute, instituting that 10 year term uh, still didn't, I mean, the president can, can fire, you know, any of these constitutional officers, you know, that he wants. And so that, that's a serious question that, you know, could be had. There's obviously a question about whether that's even constitutional, whether you can actually infringe on the president's authorities in that regard. But that's one thing that has been discussed. Uh, is possibly giving a, you know more teeth to that provision about the FBI director's tenure term, and then I think so much of the rest of it uh, is just just you know reinstituting these norms, um, which are not, are you know it's been called by um, you know a couple of Harvard professors who wrote a, a really good book about authoritarianism called it you know the norms the the soft guardrails uh, of our society where you know they kind of keep us in in in, in the middle of the road. Um, and we realized in the era of Donald Trump that, you know, he was a norm buster and just blast through. So, for example, he didn't mind going in front of the cameras and saying the FBI and the Justice Department should investigate his political enemies, which that was something that you just did not do before. And this, you know, the, um, this uh, blurring the lines between the Justice Department and the White House with Attorney General William Barr, uh, who was, you know, seen as almost a vocal advocate of Donald Trump and, and excusing some of his activity, um, that just wasn't done before. And so that's what we've learned. I think you can't legislate that, you know, fixing that, but at least bringing that, continue to have this conversation of just how important it is to keep a distance between politics and those who have the power to, to enforce the laws. And kind of on the same uh, vein with in terms of FBI directors, we have a question about um, are FBI directors selected based more on their law enforcement experience or is it more their managerial and diplom uh, diplomatic experience? I think I think more the legal experience. I think they've all been lawyers, um, all, all the the FBI directors, and that's because the FBI is a component of the Justice Department. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're enforcing the law, it, it helps to have that legal experience. Um, but th there is a question. I mean, you know, there's there's no one formula for picking an FBI director. I think a lot of times too, it comes you know, the right person uh, in the eyes of the president at, at the right moment. Um, and so, you know, if you look, for example, at, you know, so Robert Mueller obviously was was appointed, uh, who was a, a senior uh, person in the Justice Department, a Marine, Marine veteran person who was highly, uh, you know, sought after and, and thought of, uh, who was instituted. And then shortly thereafter, after he was put into place as FBI director, 9-11 happens. And then he uses those you know, that experience in national security and the military to really lead this organization uh, through a cultural shift uh, from, you know, from focusing so much on criminal to focusing on national security. And, and so you saw a lot of those, um, you know, th th those uh, uh, attributes, you know, come into play. And then Comey is kind of the same thing. I mean, Comey was you know, I think pretty much came to national attention. He was a senior uh, DOJ official, but after he was testifying about this infamous hospital scene where, you know, he and Robert Mueller were standing up to the Bush White House, who they thought were, you know, they were doing something inappropriate, um, showed that he was, you know, he could look past party lines. And I think that's why a Democratic President Obama wasn't afraid to pick a Republican, James Comey, uh, because he knew that he would, you know, do his job in an apolitical way. And so I think you, you know, each FBI director has their own, you know, skill sets and things that they bring to the table, but there's always that legal background, at least there has been. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's just up to a president to size someone up. Um, it, it's interesting, just very quickly, because I think it's important if you if you go back and uh, kind of read about Comey's interactions with with Obama when he was being interviewed, I think one thing Obama said is as they were doing small talk and talking about each other's families and getting to know each other, Obama said something to the effect of, "You realize this will be the last time we ever have a conversation like this," because Obama knew that there had to be this distance. And so, even regardless of what he thought about the FBI director, they weren't going to be chummy, they weren't going to be buddies. Fast forward to Donald Trump, who's like inviting Comey over for dinner, you know, wanting to really, uh, you know, get into his orbit. Um, it's a long-winded way of saying there are a lot that they look for an FBI director, and then some presidents, there's a lot that they look beyond that, um, you know, as we saw with Trump. And I just, a question came in. You'd mentioned uh, a book when you were answering a previous, is, is the book you're talking about, How Democracies Die? Yes. By Steve, yes. By Steve yes. Okay. Great. I, I would recommend reading that. Um, I've, I've read it a couple times now. It is uh, it, it's simply incredible. I mean, it talks about, as I mentioned, the, the guardrails, how authoritarians rise to power. And, you know, I mean, people, they may debate about Donald Trump, whether he was an authoritarian or maybe a wannabe authoritarian. Uh, but one thing that, that the authors talk about in that book is that 
would be authoritarians understand that they have to seize control of the referees, the law enforcement institutions, those who you know basically call the shots. Uh, they also try to uh, seize control of the media, who are you know the the independent entities. Uh, and so I would hi I highly recommend. I don't know if I should be recommending another book during my own book talk, but buy that book um, because it is it is uh, so worthwhile. I reference it in my book as well, um, and I think it's it's basically what the country needs now is for people to understand uh, just how the the mechanics of how an authoritarianist rises uh, and how how to prevent it. All right, so we're we're running out of time, so I'll just finish up with one last question. We have so many that came in, but um, let's finish with this. With uh, what is the FBI uh, doing right now to address extremism within their ranks? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so I, I don't know so much. We've seen any instances of extremism uh, by FBI agents. There was one person who uh, court records show from that was involved allegedly in the Capitol insurrection on January 6th, who was a former FBI, uh, not an agent or not an analyst even, but but obviously an issue there. Uh, but I think the larger, and maybe the question gets kind of to a larger point about extremism in general in the United States, and that is that Capitol domestic terrorist attack showed us that these groups continue to, to try to recruit from from law enforcement, they try to uh, recruit from the military. We know some of these extremist groups have talked about wanting to bring people into their ranks who have paramilitary-like backgrounds. And so it's a serious issue for law enforcement. Uh, we know the military, uh, the United States military has, has been publicly reported, uh, is, is basically addressing that in each unit by unit uh, uh, these so-called stand downs, they call them, where, uh, you know, members of the military will, will meet with their leadership so they can understand that look this uh, and discuss that this is a serious issue. We need to make sure that we don't have this kind of problem in our ranks. And then obviously for law enforcement, it's, it's important that they do the same because that that's, you know, obviously a, a target of recruitment, uh, people with some of those those kind of skills. And then I think and maybe this isn't to the question, but I think it's, it's something that we should continue to, to focus on as a nation. And that is, you know, you had this Trump inspired attack on the United States Capitol. And although he is is gone from public office, he's not gone from public life, obviously, um, this this extremism continues. And I talk to people inside, you know, law enforcement uh, all the time who say that this isn't in a vacuum, that attack didn't happen, and people are going to move on, they fear that there will be some kind of follow on attack. Uh, and that just shows you how difficult the FBI's job is is to try to find you know, uh, uh, those kind of threats and interdict them. And oh, by the way, doing so knowing that maybe some of the people who uh, are extremists also believe the lies about the FBI. Uh, it's just a very, very toxic combination there. And the threat is, the threat is real. Well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a truly enlightening conversation. Um, I wanna thank everyone who attended today. Uh, for being with us and, and thank you, Andrew, for leading the conversation. Uh, and I just wanna say, if you enjoyed today's program, I hope you'll consider making a donation to our Mission Resilience Campaign. As always, you can check our website calendar. We're offering a number of programs for uh, people of all ages. But with that, I wanna say, Andrew, Josh, any final words? Andrew, please. Thank, thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Likewise, thank you all for for joining. Um, and you know, let the conversation continue. I mean, hit me up on social media, Twitter, or wherever. Uh, if there are any additional questions, uh, I just love interacting with people, and I can't wait for the day when we get to do it in person again, uh, which is hopefully uh, somewhere near on the horizon. So, thank you all for for tuning in. Wonderful. Well, thank you all, and. Um, We've been dropping links to Josh's book in the chat, so definitely check that out as well. But otherwise, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon.